Hello, welcome to Hope Church Harrogate's message of the week. If you'd like to connect with us, please head over to hopeharrogate.co.uk forward slash connect. We'd love to hear from you. And Adam's going to be coming up in a minute, um, but before he does, I'm going to read today's text. Just give home. Yeah, and they see my eyesight's not that good, David. David thought I'd see it up there and I can't. <laughs> So, the reading today is 1 Corinthians 7, and starting at verse 21. No, no, I'm not. I'm starting at verse 10. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are, oh, cliffhanger, they are holy, (laughs) but if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Excellent. How would you answer? I do not need you to shout out the answer. This is a rhetorical question for your internal consideration. How would you answer if I was to ask you what is the biggest obstacle for finding fruitfulness in your life? (laughs) What is the biggest obstacle in your life to being fruitful for Jesus? I don't know what you're thinking. I know what one person's thinking because they shouted it out, but I don't know what the rest of you are thinking. You might be thinking, I just need to know more, Adam. I don't really know how to be fruitful. I just need more information. You might say, do you know what I need is the opportunity to be fruitful. I've never had the chance for someone to open the door for me to walk into fruitfulness. You might say to me, Adam, what I need is an eighth day in the week. Do you know how much I do? I'm here, there, work, home, family caring for my aged parents and running kids, eighth day of the week or a robot helper, and then I'll be fruitful for Jesus. These are all answers you might give. Other parts of the world, people might say, if people weren't persecuting me, throwing me in jail, firebombing my business, then I'd be fruitful. The Corinthians have a few answers of their own. Their answers to the question, what is the biggest obstacle to being fruitful for Jesus in your life are, number one, my spouse. Number two, my spouse again. Number three, my ethnicity. And number four, the fact I'm a slave. That's what you've just 
heard Gemma read to us. And whether you resonate with any of those answers, either the ones I gave you or the Corinthians answers, the one thing that you need to remember from today is this. Following Jesus will make you fruitful, whatever your circumstances. Following Jesus will make you fruitful, whatever your circumstances. When you put your faith in Jesus, when you are born again, his life becomes your life. It flows in your veins. You become united to him, joined with him. This is what we saw two weeks ago. If you're here for the first time, you've missed a brilliant few weeks. A couple of weeks ago, we saw we'd become joined, united, like we're stuck on with glue. The phrase in the New Testament that you find is in Christ. It's like you're within him. His life is within you. The vibrancy and vitality of the life of Jesus is in you. And if death and the grave couldn't stop that life and fruitfulness breaking out in his life, then what makes you think that any circumstance in your life could stop fruitfulness? Examples of this are all around us, if only we look. We have been out in the Dales, um, a group of us, Friday, Saturday, took our trustees and our senior leadership team and our staff team away for a retreat. I prayed hard for good weather. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, whilst I was walking around the stunning gardens at Parsifal Hall, I, and I was chewing over this week, <laughs> chewing over that following Jesus will make you fruitful, whatever your circumstances it seemed everywhere I looked, I saw a natural demonstration of this truth. Got some photos for you, because I'm kind. Here's one. Middle of a dry stone wall, growth, breaking out. Another one. A bluebell growing alone on a stony, dry, trodden down path. For some of you, these pictures may resonate. You're like, that's me. Next one. This tree had been chopped down and chopped up, but it still had shoots of life shooting out all over the place. Following Jesus will make you fruitful whatever your circumstances. But before I go any further, you may have noticed there's a fairly big question looming over us from the first few verses of what we've read. What about divorce? The first couple of lines in our passage are a response. Paul is responding to people in the church in Corinth who are reacting to the sexual immorality of the city around them and in the church that they're a part of by suggesting that maybe it would be better if people didn't get married or have sex at all. Chapter 7, verse 1, that's what he's responding to, just a few verses before what we read. The whole of chapter 7 flows out from him responding to this suggestion that they've written to him suggesting. They're like, so maybe like men should just not touch women? That's the Greek. A man should not touch a woman. That's what they've written to him. This is our solution to sexual immorality in Corinth. And it seems that within that, some people in Corinth have come to faith. They've heard about the good news of Jesus. They've heard about the worldwide spread, the fact that the gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth, the fact that this good news is something that every single person in their life needs to hear, and their reaction in their zealousness, they're, they're all out for the kingdom. Their reaction is, do you know what? What's holding me back from being fruitful on this is my spouse. Maybe I should get divorced so I can be fruitful for the kingdom. That's the context of what you've just read, uh, heard. We've read together. Now, I've been in pastoral ministry 13 years. Let me tell you the exact number of times somebody has asked me this question. Should I get divorced to be more fruitful for the, spirit, the kingdom of God? 
I doubt it's a question, question you've been asked. asked. I doubt it's a question you're asking. I would suggest it certainly isn't the question that we might, in general, be asking when I put, what about divorce, on the screen. But that's the question that's in the background of what we've just read. Who knows it's really important to understand the context of what you're reading to know what it's actually saying. The reply to the question is a rather unequivocal no. And Paul says, but that's not my answer, that's the Lord's answer. And what he means is, we've got direct teaching about this from Jesus. You've heard the stories of what Jesus said about this. You don't need to ask that question, you know what Jesus says. If you want to follow Jesus, he's already told you. It's unlikely at this point, for those interested, that the Gospels have been written. But the Gospels are based on the oral tradition of the stories that were passed around around the teaching of Jesus. So they would have heard pretty much what you're reading spoken out in their church gatherings. He's like, you've got the teaching of Jesus. The Lord has told you. A few verses later, he says, not the Lord, I. And he's not saying what I'm bringing you here is sort of secondary wisdom. He's saying, you've not got anything Jesus said about this because he didn't have to talk about spouses leaving, believing, unbelieving spouses leaving, believing spouses. You're following me, right? Good. At least one of it is. So Jesus never taught something. He's like, so I've not got something from Jesus, but I'm telling you, this is how to do it. That's what's going on. You can find Jesus' teaching in two places, Mark chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 19. And today, we're talking about 1 Corinthians 7, but we're going down a layer. We're going Matthew 19 in a minute. We're going to enter the, that movie, Inception. I'm going to go down like a third layer of interpretation just to get there. So I'm just warning you. Verse 3, Matthew 19. Some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Note a few things. They come to test him. They ask him a specific question. He's not on the hillside giving his full general teaching on divorce. He's asked a specific question question. They're testing him and they ask him a specific question. Is it lawful, that's an interesting word, for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Here's the answer. In the Roman Empire, it was. A man could divorce his wife for any reason he wanted with a word. I don't think it was get out, but it was probably similar. Jewish law was a little different and we'll see that in a moment. Verse 4. Thanks. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Or if you go to old fashioned weddings often in your life, let no one put asunder. So it comes from, I'm not going, stay on that pit slide. Sorry, David, I didn't give you any briefing whatsoever. Jesus replies to them and he references Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. He affirms God's good creation for marriage is for a man and a woman to have a permanent, faithful, monogamous relationship. They become joined together, united, stuck with glue is kind of how that word is sometimes used. It becomes inseparable and he adds what God has joined together, let no one separate. They continue because they're testing him, remember? Verse 7. Why then, they asked, because they're testing him, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So we arrive at the Jewish law. This is what they're discussing. You find it in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Welcome to Inception. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her out from his home. Verse 1 of Deuteronomy 24. I know it's not a full sentence. 
The wider context goes on to talk about how it's actually a protection for women. There are a few things. Number one, the husband had to write it down. Writing something down gives you a moment for reflection before you say something you regret. It stops you doing it when you're drunk, for example. The certificate he had to write, write explicitly said, you are free to marry another man. And it meant that he wasn't able to remarry her later. That's what Deuteronomy 24 goes on to say. You're going to divorce this woman? You need to be really sure you actually want to divorce her because you can't have her back. I know it's not like the best protection you might be desiring. That's another message. Remember, the Pharisees are testing Jesus. They're trying to catch him out. They're trying to get him to say something that they can jump on. And what they're trying to do is get him to weigh in on a conversation that's happening in their world. And so in Judaism at the time, everybody would have agreed that a man could have divorced his wife, but they would have had different reasons for what was acceptable. There were two main schools of thought. One was the school of Shammai. And Shammai had taught, and now his followers were repeating, that Deuteronomy 24, when it says the indecent thing, or something indecent, means sexual immorality. It's a, it's a sexual indecency. Either she uh, wasn't a virgin when they got married, or she'd had an affair and cheated on him. The school of Hillel, which he had taught, and now his school were perpetuating, they said, no, 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 Deuteronomy 24 is just fine, something indecent. Let me give you a couple of examples from the writings at the time of what the school of Hillel thought was indecent. Burning your meal. This gets better. Finding another woman more attractive than your wife. Which side was Jesus on? That's what they're asking. Is it lawful to divorce a woman for any and every reason? Verse 3, that's what we read. Is Hillel right? Are the Romans right? Jesus says, first of all, Moses did not command you to divorce your wives. He permitted you, and that's a really big difference. Second of all, the law was only actually given because your hearts were hard. It was not supposed to be this way from the beginning. It's a concession because of the impact of sin. Divorce is not part of God's very good creation. That's true of lots of things, something we often forget when we come to this topic in the church. Then he says that divorce, followed by remarriage, unless it was for sexual immorality, is adultery. He says Shammai has the right understanding of the law. Hillel is wrong. Verse 10. The disciples said to Jesus, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. Now, you may think what I've been saying is hard to hear, hard to accept. It might comfort you to know that Jesus' disciples agree with you. You just might not like their solution. Let me summarize a very complex thing in 10 handy points. Number one, God's creation intention is for... Ma oh, I I did the whole clicky thing. They were going to come up one after another. Yeah, if you could all just cover up two to, two to eight. God's creation intention is for marriage to be a permanent, lifelong, faithful, monogamous joining of one man and one woman. We've said it a lot. I feel like I've said it an awful lot, having done three sex and sexuality sessions and speaking two weeks ago on a similar. That's his creation intention. You're allowed to be confident in it. Number two, permanence is the point. You are theirs and they are yours. You are joined. And that commitment means that you are called to overflow with grace. It means you are called, both of you, to work on the relationship and make it work. It means that you are both called to endure difficulty, which will come. You're both called to prioritize the other, which is the only way a marriage is ever going to work. And you have a whole lifetime to intentionally seek out the depths of the other person's personality, character, and gifts, and to take delight in them. Who knows 
that you could talk to someone for five minutes and they might like you, but you could talk to them for five hours and they might not like you so much. But if you've got 50 years, and you're definitely going to do it. It gives you a safety. This mutual assurance of the permanence of marriage is a security to both parties. One of the biggest challenges in our world at the moment is cohabitation. It's fundamentally insecure for both the people doing it and the, any children in the place. Social science research says massively reduced life outcomes as a consequence. Children that grow up in a family unit with two parents vastly outperform broken homes. Permanence is the point. Number three, things go wrong. Have you noticed? Notice things go wrong? Sin is real. No one is perfect. What? The world is broken. Number four, divorce is serious and extreme. The passage we read today, Paul brings zero nuance, right? He's like, don't do it. I've given you the context already. I want to give you a slight, I think it's humorous. You might not. Example to try and help us find this. If I pick up the phone and call 111 and say to the doctor, I've got a problem with my arm, should I cut it off? What will the doctor at the other end of the phone line say to me? No, you need your arm. Your arm is supposed to stay connected to your body for the rest of your life, Adam. Permanence is the point. If you have to go through life thinking my arm might drop off at any particular moment, that's a very different way of life. Dismembering my arm would be serious and extreme. The doctor on the other end of the phone is going to say, no, Adam, do not chop off your arm. They're very unlikely to say, actually, there are a list of very rare and extreme circumstances under which maybe you should at this exact moment put one of those things around your shoulder and cut your own arm off. Do those situations exist? Paul is bringing the blunt response of the doctor on the other end of the phone line. Don't do it. I mean, their question is absurd, first of all. But then you come to the teaching of Jesus and it contains more information. It's just irrelevant to the question the Corinthians are asking, so Paul doesn't include it. Number five, divorce is immensely painful. On the very rare and extreme occasions that my arm might need amputating, I would go on to experience considerable pain, grief, and a pervading sense of loss in my life. I would face a battle over many years to unlearn patterns of life that I had lived with for many years, and learn new ones. So too with divorce. There is no such thing as quick or easy divorce. For some of us, probably many of us in this room, either by personal experience directly or with loved ones, we all know this to be true. Divorce is immensely painful. Six. Across these passages that we've read today, there are three reasons given for divorce. Number one, it is permitted but not commanded for sexual immorality. Let me tell you, it is possible to come back from sexual immorality in your marriage. Do you know what? The church around the world is full of people who have come back from sexual immorality in their marriages to have healthy, thriving, fruitful marriages. It is possible to forgive. It is possible to rebuild trust. It is possible to thrive again. Though in the depths of betrayal, you might not feel like it. Divorce for sexual immorality is permitted but not commanded. Secondly, divorce is permitted where the unbelieving spouse leaves. 
That's what we read today. Thirdly, divorce happens because of people's hard-heartedness. That's what Jesus says. He says, it wasn't this way at the beginning, but because your hearts are hard, you were permitted to get divorced. Seven, let's not kid ourselves that those are three neat and tidy categories. There is all kind of variation within them, and unless you'd like to stay until this evening, there is absolutely no way that I can possibly begin to unpack all of the variation within the three. There is tons, absolutely tons, that remains unspoken about by Jesus and the rest of the scriptures on this matter. If I were to break you into groups and we were to brainstorm reasons that are not covered by what we've read, we would have a lot. Number eight, what's clear is that divorce is tragic, but not shameful. Some of you need to hear this. Sometimes it's the only choice left because of the hardness of people's hearts. Sometimes it's the only choice left for your safety. Sometimes it's the only choice left for your sanity because you're about to lose your mind and lose yourself. Sometimes divorce is done to you and you don't get a say. Divorce is tragic, but not shameful. Sometimes divorce is an option, but so is humbling yourself, throwing yourself at the mercy of God and asking for help. Again. Number nine. This is personal for God. Tim Keller says divorce is sometimes necessary and some people are awfully self-righteous about divorce and look down their noses at any divorced person. But Jeremiah 3 verse 8, in that place, God says, I divorced Israel. God has the audacity, says Tim Keller, to call himself a divorced person. So if you don't want to have anything to do with divorced persons, you are in the unenviable position of not having anything to do with God. Because God is not afraid to call himself a divorced person. That's fire. Number 10. Oh no, back to number 9 a second. Sorry. Interestingly, it's very likely personal for Paul too. We don't know for certain, but what we do know is that Pharisees were nearly always married. And to be in the Sanhedrin, which was the council of Pharisees, you had to be married. And in Acts, we find out that Paul cast votes in the Sanhedrin, in the council. Which tells us that when he was a Pharisee in the Jewish faith, he was married. Or an extreme, isolated case. And then he was riding along the road one day on the way to Damascus, and Jesus appeared and knocked him off his horse. He was blinded by the light and he gave his life to Jesus and converted. Sure looks from what we've read like his wife didn't want to stay with him after that. Perhaps she was the daughter of some influential Jewish family. She wasn't knocked off her horse. She didn't have the risen Jesus appear to her. She didn't follow him into the faith. She didn't want to stay with him anymore. So he was divorced. This is personal for Paul. Some people don't like Paul. They say he hates women and that he's really harsh. They're wrong. It's personal. Can you imagine writing 1 Corinthians 7 when that's your own experience? Number 10, divorce is not the unforgivable sin. Because that's not what Jesus says, right? Repentance wipes the slate clean. I mean, did it for you? Did it for me. Grace is an unending river. Amen. Get you awkward now. Tim Keller again. God is trying to say to all of us, I love redeeming the worst situations. I love to bless the hardest cases. Try me. Come to me. No one has ever perished at Jesus' feet. No one who ever came to him was in any way cast out.
10 points which fully clears up all of your questions that you've ever had on divorce. It doesn't matter what the situation of your life is, following Jesus will make you fruitful. That's this passage. If your marriage is going great, following Jesus will make you fruitful. If your marriage is at death's door, following Jesus will make you fruitful. If your marriage is incredibly hard work and you cry at night about it, following Jesus will make you fruitful. If your marriage is dead and gone, it's over, and you are divorced, following Jesus will make you fruitful. If your marriage is gone and it was your fault, following Jesus will make you fruitful. If you've never been married, following Jesus will make you fruitful. If you never get married, guess what? Following Jesus will make you fruitful. If you long to get married and you haven't met someone, not marriage. Marriage doesn't make you fruitful. Following Jesus makes you fruitful. Fruitfulness is not dependent upon you finding the right combination of ingredients and combining them in the perfect place and putting them in at the right temperature for the right amount of time in the oven. Fruitfulness in your life is dependent upon the life of Jesus flowing through you. Fruitfulness is about who you are joined to. And if you are joined to Jesus, then his life flows in your veins. It's so easy, friends, so easy to think that a change, a transformation in my circumstances will make me fruitful. I think it to myself all the time. But God's plan is that a transformation inside you will make you fruitful. Hallelujah. Our culture trains us to equate fruitfulness with what we can see and hold. We have to be able to measure it. But God says that the storehouses of heaven are not revealed by your earthly circumstances. So you can look at your hands all you want, but they don't tell you the truth. Because what you have in your hands doesn't tell you about what eternity holds. A fruitful life following Jesus is not free from friction and frustration. That took me 10 minutes. A fruitful life following Jesus is not free from friction and frustration. Sometimes we think if we're following Jesus in our sweet spot, whoosh, Nah. If Jesus had trouble, you will have trouble. The Lord, not I. If Jesus was tempted, you will be tempted. If Jesus was failed by his friends, you will be failed by your friends. If Jesus was misunderstood, you will be misunderstood. If Jesus lived the full human life, died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins to heal a broken world, rose from the dead into glorious life and gave the same spirit that did that to his followers, then following Jesus will make you fruitful. Even when there's friction and frustration. A fruitful life following Jesus is not free from friction and frustration. I was talking with a friend of mine earlier this week, he's in his 70s, about the power of praying grandparents. Only in eternity will we see and they see the fruitfulness of their faithful prayers. I'm convinced the only reason I'm here today is the faithful prayers of grandparents and the older saints in the church I grew up in. Pretty confident you are too. If you're still a fairly active grandparent, your prayers. If you're reaching the end of your active grandparenthood, let me tell you, when we get to heaven, we're going to see the fruit that was born by the faithful prayers of people in nursing homes that could do nothing else, but their spirit was alive and they prayed. They're sowing seeds in a garden that they'll never get to see. 
until it stands before them in heaven. God can make you fruitful whatever your circumstances. As Jesus sat with his disciples in the temple courts, they were people watching. Reassures me to know that I can people watch because Jesus did. And he turned to his disciples at one particular moment and went, do you know who the most fruitful person in this temple court is? It's that lady over there. Oh, why? Oh, well, she just put two tiny small coins in the offering. But they were her only two coins. Those two coins were more fruitful than all of the gold poured in by everybody else. Because the fruitfulness of generosity had welled up in her life. God was able to do more with those two mites than the gold that the rich had put in. God can make you fruitful whatever your circumstances. Brother Lawrence was a monk in France in the 1600s. He spent all day every day doing menial tasks in the kitchen. Yet people flocked from around Europe to spend time with him. People still read his book today, practicing the presence of God. Because as he stood in that kitchen doing boring, menial tasks that are beneath you and me, maybe, he did so whilst worshipping in the presence of God, training his attention onto the beauty of the king and the practices that forged that in his life have lasted 400 years since and will go into eternity. God can make you fruitful whatever your circumstances. What we've read today is simply saying is that if God can reach you in a circumstance and if God can save you in a circumstance, then surely, surely God can make you fruitful in that very same circumstance. If he can reach you and save you, he can make you fruitful. Are you a slave? No problem. Following Jesus will make you fruitful. But if you get the chance, make yourself free. Are you Jewish? No problem. Following Jesus will make you fruitful. Are you not Jewish? Not a slave? Which I'm willing to bet a large percentage of this room. No problem. Following Jesus will make you fruitful. Following Jesus will make you fruitful. Whatever your circumstance. You want a word from the Lord? Following Jesus will make you fruitful, whatever your circumstance. Can I invite you to stand for a moment? I'm going to pray for us. I reckon we can sing again. Yeah. The presence of God amongst us when we were worshiping before was sweet. It fills you with confidence as a preacher when you're about to bring a woo, weighty word. You're like, wow, God's in the room. It's going to be okay. I've got two things I want to do. Two things that I just felt God eating away at me inside about to bring response for. Um, I haven't yet decided how we're going to respond. But this is what we're going to respond to. Number one. I want to pray that the redeeming power of God would blow all shame off of those who've been through divorce in this church. And I want to pray that God would give a sense call and commission to be fruitful as you follow Jesus. Number two, there's a verse that grabbed me, but I couldn't ratchet it into my talk. And I said, God, what's that about? He said, it's a word. Genesis 41, verse 52. Joseph is having children. This is the verse. The second son, Joseph, named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. You want an Ephraim word this morning? 
Want to be fruitful in the land of your suffering? Do you know what it is to be trapped as Joseph was? Overlooked as Joseph was? Abused as Joseph was? Misunderstood as Joseph was? God does not need to move you to somewhere new in order for you to be greatly fruitful. It might be connected to marriage and divorce for you, but it might not be. If your marriage has not been great, you can claim it. There's overflowing grace for you to live in and receive. It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Wow. Wow. I think there's something about taking hold of these words this morning. I think it's a little bit too exposing to call you to the front. But if you know you want to be fruitful in the land of your suffering, or you need shame to fall off you as a result of divorce, why don't you just, where you are right now, make yourself known to God. Might like to get your hands out in front of you, hands on your heart. You can put your hands sky high if you want to claim it. Really happy to pray with people afterwards. But either of these two other people would be as well. Right, number one. In the name of Jesus, I dispel shame yes. that has landed on those who are divorced. It's ungodly, the shame, not the divorce. I want to pray for a lightness of spirit to come upon you that you've not known in decades. And I pray right now that the Spirit of God would freshly commission you to fruitfulness in the place he's put you as you follow Jesus. Number two, if you're in the land of your suffering, I want to pray that Ephraim truth. Lord Jesus, I pray that those who know deeply and feel strongly that they are in a season, in a place of suffering, I pray that by your power, through your spirit, you would make them fruitful in the land of their suffering as they follow Jesus. Following Jesus will make you fruitful, whatever your circumstances. Amen. Well, 